Well, I was tempted to uh, title today's sermon, How to Change Your Husband, <laughs> which is something I would deliver on, but because I wouldn't actually say it the way that most people would want me to, um, I thought I don't want to face a hangry hostile, hostile mob afterwards. So I decided instead to title it the equally appropriate Winning Ways. Because the principles of God's word that we're going to be looking at today don't just apply to winning over a husband that's a little wayward or a a pointy-eared boss, but basically it's going to present for us character traits and actions that each of us should engage in as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll look at the first six verses. And it's in the context of a letter that we've been exploring which basically tells us we're in a war where our desires war against our soul. And if we don't handle and kill those desires, um, we're going to become casualties along the way. We also looked earlier in 1 Peter chapter 2 about our responsibility to submit to various institutions for the Lord's sake. And when we do that, it also benefits us. So uh, way back when we looked at the S word and an overall study of submission, we'll be reviewing some of those principles as we saw them earlier in Peter. And today, Peter kind of narrows his focus. He's done uh, governments and he's done employers to wives submitting to their husbands. Now, when I was thinking about how I'd handle the scheduling and everything, I thought, well, I should probably do you know, husbands first to make this idea of submitting to your husbands more palatable. Because whenever you talk about submitting to your husbands, the wife is always thinking, oh, well, he, he's got to submit to me, too. If you actually said those passages, you realize that's not the case. And I realized, you know, when the Spirit of God motivated Peter and also Paul on other spots to write these things, he didn't address husbands first. He addressed wives first. This is a really important principle here. Submission is irregardless of what the other person does. Ugly, ugly truth. <laughs> and somewhere, I'm sure there's flesh revolting. <laughs> but if you understand the principles we're going to look at today, you'll say, oh yeah, well that makes perfect sense. So hopefully if I do my job right, you'll see that. If not, ask. Okay, First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, this is kind of a conglomeration of uh, translations because I couldn't find anyone that got it um, 100%. Um, <laughs> implying that some of us did, but you know. You guys know. <laughs> Wives, likewise, in the same manner as slaves, masters, uh, citizens to governments, and Christ to Father, be submissive or submit to your own husbands. That even if some of them are pointy haired husbands, even if some of them do not obey, even if some of them do not believe the word, they, without a word from you, i.e. nagging, Greek word to mean try to get your own way, will be won by the conduct of their wives. This context is like unbelievable. I mean, I have a husband who is disobeying the word, not believing the word, and I'm not supposed to say anything to him? And that's going to change him? Well, there are other verses that follow that kind of pack that up. But yeah, that's kind of the idea. And this does not just apply to husbands with wives. It applies to put here bosses and other authority situations. The way you're going to win them is when they observe how you act. Your actions are going to win them over. And this is repeated multiple times in Peter. It's going to show up again later. Uh, When even neighbors say bad things about you, you can win them over when they observe your actions. When they slander you, you can still win them over. So I titled this Winning Ways. It's how to have a winsome Christian lifestyle. I like the word winsome. It's kind of a cheerful uh, word. We don't use it much. But it, it's true. It's a cheerful thing that basically helps persuade folks in the right direction. I'd like to first zero in on a word in chapter, verse 1 of chapter 3, verse Peter. It says, even if some of these husbands do not believe or obey the word, literally, this word means they're not persuaded about doesn't necessarily mean they're unbelievers. There are lots of people who believe the word, but just or believe in Jesus, but aren't persuaded about the word. And they don't think it says what it says, but you should be able to win them over. Uh, this is not 
the way you should engage in all your relationships when people disagree with the Word of God, but it's a way that is appropriate in some settings. So they're going to be one, they're gained to following the Word, when the husbands observe the wife's pure, sacred, sinless conduct. For some reason, one of the early translators put this down as chaste. They were like two or three times in the New Testament where it's appropriate. But the basic idea behind this word, even in pagan Greek culture, was someone who was ritually pure and thus was doing what the gods wanted. It's kind of almost a variation of our understanding of godliness. So when the husbands observe the pure, sacred, <coughs> sinless conduct of the wives, that is coupled with respect or fear for the husband, they'll be won over without a word. We'll talk about appeals, and we need to have a talk a little bit later. Uh, number three, <laughs> some of the scariest words in the English language for you guys. Other ones are nothing and fine. <laughs> All right, got it. Sorry guys, I didn't mean to upset, upset you like that. Don't let your adornment, your cosmetology, be outward. They threw in mere, merely because it's talking about, in your adorning, don't let it be the outward stuff. If you want to be adorned, don't let it be arranging your hair, wearing gold, putting on clothes. Literally, it's clothes. Um, so there are people who are really against uh, arranging their hair and wearing gold, uh, but for some reason they're, you know, not Christian naturalist. Um, but, and, but let it be instead something that's on the inside, something that you can't see. That's where this takes place, where God sees the hidden person of the heart. Let it be the incorruptible beauty of a meek and tranquil spirit. Now I realize meek doesn't communicate in our culture anymore, but it's the best word I could find, and when I explain it, you'll understand it. Tranquil is pretty good, um, incorrectly translated, quiet sometimes. Which is very precious in the sight of God. Wait a minute, did you catch that? There are some things that God really, really, really likes. It's not just precious to Him, very precious. And that's when people have on the inside of their being this meek and tranquil spirit. I think He would be pleased if guys had this as well. It's like, oh yeah, I really love that on a gal, but boy, guys, no, this doesn't apply to you. We like you non-meek and really agitated. <laughs> we like you proud, boastful, arrogant, and noisy. No, that's, that's not what this is about. This is for guys and gals. This is something that God values, which we should have in the inner part of our being. Because on this side, proving it, this is a good idea, because in this manner, in former times, holy women who hoped or trusted in God, the little word is hope, King James translated trusted, and a lot of people followed that, also adorned themselves in this manner, by being submissive to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you'll be your daughters if you do what's good and are not afraid of any alarm. So the idea is you can follow in Sarah's footsteps of a woman who is pleasing to God and blessed by God and enter into her the blessings that she would get if you do what she did. She obeyed Abraham. She called him Lord. I thought his name was Abe. <laughs> I didn't want your coffee today, Lord. Sarah, it's Abe, okay? Um, and if you do what's good and are not afraid, no, like, what's this afraid come in? And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the passage. So hopefully we'll understand it. Um, I picked up a woman who was a daughter of Sarah. Some of you know her, her name is Jill. And uh, one of the things she brought with her into our relationship was a copy of the Amplified Bible. Uh, I've never seen this before. And uh, yeah, I paced through it, and it's kind of good because it elaborated some stuff. And uh, one of the things that fell out of this Bible once as I was looking at it, it was an index card on which she had written 1 Peter 3. So here I am, growing up in a very dysfunctional environment, and I marry this woman, and in a Bible she's carrying around a card that says this on it, uh, 1 Peter 3.3 3 in the Amplified, 
when they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves, together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect him, to defer to him, to revere him, to honor him, to esteem him, to appreciate him, to prize him, and in the human sense, to adore him. That is, to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Sounds good to me. <laughs> and a lot of women are thinking, you don't know my husband. <laughs> well, you're supposed to actually be able to make him into this kind of critter through this. And I had purpose at that time to try to live up to this added, you know, be the kind of person that this could be. Make it easy for Jill to do this. And I've succeeded, I'm a play, mostly. Okay. <laughs> I think, uh, as a father of two daughters, it's kind of scary uh, to think about they eventually need to act like this towards some guy yeah. who's going to be a complete jerk. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll said, you know, marrying off one of your daughters is like entrusting a Stradivarius violin to a gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's like, it's, it's scary, um, however, it's only scary to the degree that your God is small. If you have a big God, it's not scary. And we'll take a look at that in a few minutes. Let's review some of the stuff that we talked about in submission in general. Submission is lining up under authority. Okay, that's, that's a military term. Who both pass out stand under, and it's used of lining up under the authority of a military superior in other contexts as well. It's willingly yielding our rights and our preferences for the goal of God glorifying <coughs> unity. Uh, that was one of my like it's summary statements that works for marriage, in particular, it works for church. Um, you can almost work in corporate settings. It's a pretty decent definition. I'm going to tweak it a little bit down below uh, to reflect some of the difficulties that I see people having trouble with. But the basic thing is you yield what you want for some higher objective. It's not hard. But that's, like, that's the essence of the Christian life. Which maybe is hard. Um, one of my favorite passages for this is Mary. You know, if God could have picked anybody on the planet to be the mother of Jesus. And he chose this young Hebrew gal whose response to this really incredible and troubling thing, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to her, was, Behold, I'm your servant. Let it be done to me, like you said. And that's just like, that's the thing. Okay, I'm your servant. I am your servant. Handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. What you said, that's, what, that's the way it goes. Real, real simple. That's the essence of the Christian life. God, I'm your servant. What do you say? I do. No problem. Easy. Church over. <laughs> oh, pizza's not here yet. Okay. Um, and this works out that our chief obedience is to God. Um, there's going to be times where you have to say we must obey God rather than man. Acts 5.29. And sometimes suffer for it. Uh, Hebrews 4.19. We've looked at that in the past. Submission is really important because failure to submit opens us up to demonic attack. And I think most people are um, influenced by Satan. And most people are influenced by Satan more than the Spirit of God because they want to live independently of God. They don't want to do what God said. Real simple. Um, James 4, 7 says, you know, submit to God, resist the devil, then he flees from you. If you're not submitted to God, the devil's going to be there making your life miserable. And the funny thing is, a lot of people blame God for doing that, but it's not God's fault. Roman number three, we submit to God, we submit to government, we submit to parents, we submit to spiritual leaders, we submit to employers, we submit to one another. There's an interesting idea. Um, I think Fiona's praise about the plane ticket was a great example of a submission to another. Someone said, don't get the ticket until the next day. But they keep going up, you know, all right, but that's, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then she winds up getting a cheaper ticket. Probably even got a great seat, too, we'll have to see. <laughs> I'd be praying for an upgrade for you. <laughs> and last but not least, number seven, submit to husbands. So actually, all of you have one through six to submit to. 
and a smaller subset of you have husbands to submit to. But submission is Christ-like, Roman number four. It's designed by God for our benefit. I mean, he's God, we're not. He's wise, we're not. He knows what's best, we don't. So why don't we do things his way? Um, last but not least, uh, there should be another one on there. Oh yeah, submission actually occurs in the gray areas. Okay, I'll submit and I won't kill a person. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's obedience, right? You're in obeying God. Submission is in those things where the scriptures aren't really clear on. Submission are sometimes the things that the scriptures might even be saying something differently. You all know the story of Abraham and Sarah. You're good looking. He's going to kill me to get you. So say you're my sister. And then things go well for me. But, hey, if I do that, he's going to take me to his harem. Hmm. Wow. And she, yes, Lord. What do you say, boss? Uh, kind of really scary. And if you go to the story, I'll get to it later. God protected her. Any problem, there's nothing to fear. Submission requires, and this is what Sarah had, trust. Well, that's in big capital letters, that must be important. Oh yeah, that life of faith thing. It's trust that God is good, that God is sovereign, that God is almighty. That means he can do anything. That he knows what he's doing, he's wise. That he's a just judge, he will you know, fix everything. And he rewards those who fear him. Yeah, right, that's like the essence of who God is. Not hard. We always are tempted to not believe those things about him. And it's not good, he makes make my life miserable. He's not in control, he's on vacation somewhere and things got out of hand. He, he really can't do this, he's kind of weak. Um, he really doesn't know what he's doing. I know better because obviously it's my life. And you know, it's really unfair the way you let this situation happen. And oh, there are no rewards. And it's like I constantly hear lies in the opposite direction about this, usually from believers. So submission requires trust that God is who he said he is. And will reward those who diligently seek him. It's all about Hebrews 11, 6. Submission requires some things, and I've covered most of these a little before. Um, I'm going to elaborate on these down below. But it's a yieldedness to God and embracing of his will. Not my will, but thy will be done. I, I love Jesus in the garden. I mean, that, that is, you know, how do you live the Christian life? Say what Jesus said. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's it, real simple. And you all know Satan got himself into problems. I say y'all. Wow, stuck in there. <laughs> Satan got himself into trouble because I will ascend to the most. I will, I will, I will. And Jesus says, not my will, Father, but your will be done. So that's, that's the essence of it. It requires intelligence. It's not mindless you know, stupidity. It requires humility, which has some sense of transparency. Uh, a good self-image. It's actually hard to submit if you have a bad self-image. It requires some flexibility, which is writing your uh, agenda in pencil, because you know, following God means changes. I mean, that's one of the major lessons when Israel is going through the wilderness. God's saying, turn left, turn right, let's go around in a circle again. You know, he's just leading and guiding them, and he, you know, just when they settle down, it's up, oh, you know, clouds moving, time to get up. Okay, let's go. Okay, now we'll settle down. And God is basically marching Israel through close order drill to get their will attuned with his will, which is what the military does to get recruits to start doing what they're supposed to be doing. And this last part of submission requires a preferring and honoring um, others above ourselves, which means you have to have affirmation from God that you can pass along to others. So you got to basically be yielded to God, doing what he wants. You're feeling good about yourself because of that, and then you can actually pass that along to others. As Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, don't do anything through self-seeking ambition. This is used of a person electioneering for an office. Yeah, vote for me, vote for me, do this, this, and kind of position and everything, just like various uh, party committees conduct elections. Nor do anything through empty, boasting, self-glory, but in humility or lowliness of mind, esteem others as more important, higher, superior than yourselves. Don't look out for your interests, look out for their interests also, says Paul in Philippians 2. Okay, so that's all review, and now we get into changing your husband. <laughs> <laughs> all 
Our ability to submit to others is a reflection of our submission to God. Whenever you see kids not in submission to the parent or the mother, you'll see a parent not in submission to God. It's kind of scary. Um, I, I am so tempted when I see a kid who's you know, wildly out of control to uh, kind of say a few words to a mother. Occasionally, Jill fails to restrain me, and I do. <laughs> I in Walmart last week. <laughs> Uh, All right, I guess. You got arrested? No. <laughs> <laughs> Bit said. <laughs> so the guy got arrested in Walmart because he disciplined someone else's kid. Oh. Okay. Yeah. No, what would you say? What would you say that? Woman, get a hold of your child. That's <laughs> the <laughs> situation. But I, I basically know that that woman isn't receptive because the kids have learned how to submit to her as they've observed her submit to the husband. And then you also know the husband isn't really submitted to God either. It just, it's a chain of command. If you see a private, you know, in the army, doing his thing really well, you know that all the way up the chain of command, things are going well. When you see him screwing up, you realize, well, the way up, there's somewhere, and someone is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So, if we are submitted to God, and we embrace God's will for our life, then submitting to others is no big deal. When people cannot submit to others, you know they are not submitted to God. Romans 8, 7, the carnal, fleshly mind, the one that's just set on the stuff of this world, basically it's a worldling, they might believe in Jesus, but they are a worldling, is an enemy against God, hostile towards God. It is not subjected or submitted to the law of God. Indeed, it cannot be. Translations here. So a person who is not submitted to God is someone who's just focused on this world rather than what God wants. B, submission to God and others requires knowing and trusting God for protection and what's best when it's best. That's also something I've talked about a lot. If you think God is wise, then don't you think he knows what's best? Do you think he's all powerful? Don't you think he's able to give it to you? Submission to God requires knowing and trusting him for protection knowing and trusting him for what's best and when it's best. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, you know, if you want to come after me, deny yourself. Your very being. Take up your cross every day and follow me. And if you're thinking of saving the stuff on this life, you're going to lose it. But if you work on losing it, you're going to gain it. So it's kind of, you have to give to get. Uh, he has some other phrases in it. He calls people to discipleship and says, you know, a grain of wheat, just going to stay a grain of wheat if it just kind of clings to being a grain of wheat. But if it lets go of the stalk and dies, it becomes something that multiplies and is fruitful and has life and gives life to others and it's all, all good. So whenever I see someone who's not submitted um, to God, I know they can't trust God very well. And when something comes into their life, they don't trust God. C. Submission requires fear of the Lord. Um, I'm not sure where I get more pushback on rewards or fear of the Lord. They're both combined. But over the years, you know, I have to put this up at the top of the list. Submission is probably you know, the top five, but these are usually the top two. Things that Satan has twisted people's thinking, and they just don't buy fear of the Lord. And then I realize they're fools. That's what the Word of God says. But submission requires fear of the Lord, because in submitting you're going to be doing some stuff that is scary. But you need a bigger fear. Would I rather put myself in a temporally difficult situation or an eternally difficult situation? And Jesus said, don't fear those who can just hurt your body. Fear those who in the future can really cause problems for you. So sometimes when submitting, you don't see how it's going to work out, but you know, it's what God wants. Fear of the Lord is an awareness that the God who judges is watching and remembering everything we think, do, and say. That means he's going to hold you accountable. So people who don't understand God's justice just don't buy this, and they worship a God that doesn't exist, except in their own minds. Submission requires death to our agenda, death to our ambitions. At the very core of our being, our prayer is, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? So if you haven't decided to die to yourself, deny yourself, kill all that stuff, 
you are not submitted to God, and it's going to show up in the fact that you're not submitted to others, and you will live unhappily ever after, uh, married or single. Okay, so what I'm doing now on the outline is the next ten items, they could have been done a whole lot more artfully, but, you know, I got lost in doing some work study, so I didn't focus on the art form. Is These are things that come out of the passage up top. Character traits that, almost without exception, or might be one or so, that are things that all believers should have in various spheres. And Peter told the women that if you got this dolt for a husband, and you want to win him over to being a wonderful godly man, then you can do that. And the goal is to win him. To win, to gain. And you will get some benefit out of this. It's going to require work, but it's going to be worth it. You get joyful, winsome gain from embracing and serving the agenda of God and the other person. Joy is the hallmark of a submitted person. Someone who is moping and complaining and grumbling about submission is not submitting. It's not God's way. This is supposed to be joy for the thing. Joy comes from choosing what's best. Big theme out of Philippians. And if you don't have joy, it means you haven't chosen what's best. And if you haven't chosen what's best, it means you're not submitting. It's real simple. No joy, no submission, because you haven't chosen what's best. Obedience would fit that line too, but submission is a big year. Um, also requires, joy comes from God gives what's best when it's best. So if you think about that, if you are really expecting what's best to come, you'll have joy. It's pretty simple. Now this idea of trying to gain things is a good biblical concept I see in Paul's life in two spots, and I think this is applicable for every single believer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.19, although I'm free from every man, you know, I, I don't, I'm not under anybody's thumb, I'm free from all of them. Even though I am free from them, um, I make myself a slave to everyone. So, let me get this straight, Paul. You're a free man, you can do what you want. And you basically go about serving other people's needs like a slave. Everyone. I mean, everyone in the office dumps their work on you. Well, if you get it all done within the parameters of your job, great, do it. Because his goal is to win as many as possible. Do you get the connection between serving and winning? The way up is down. The way to win happy in the future, is to serve as a slave. Wow. I don't see that very frequently, but it's a good idea. A little insight into Paul, who I think was a super servant and uh, is pretty, living pretty well right now in heaven. He says, I consider everything a loss compared to his present worth in Christ, for whose sake I have lost everything and I consider them dung, the word for dung, that I might gain something which is Christ for him. So the principle is here, all this great stuff that Paul had accumulated, he considered a pile of steaming camel dung. That's it. Because he was willing to get rid of all of it to gain something that was worth far, far more. So I thought about the things in our life. You know, our... Um, personalities, our education, our houses, our cars, those who live outside the city, you know, all those things, our jobs, our titles, our bank accounts, all that stuff, you need to envision it as a pile of steaming camel dung. And if you don't get to that point, you're never going to get to the stuff that God has in store for you. And you're going to be basically giving your life for a pile of camel dung. I love, whenever I hear the word dung, I think of a, well, some sort of National Geographic special I saw when I was a kid. There's a thing called a dung beetle. Yes. It lives in the desert, and it spends its life kind of rolling dung balls along the sand dunes from the camels. You know, they roll it up into a little ball, and they push it down in the sand dune to get it to their spot to store it away. And I thought, 
wow, what a great image for what goes on in the halls of corporate America. <laughs> Just think, all of your fellow workers are there rolling their little ball of camel dung down the hall. That's what they're giving their life for. Their prestige, their office, their titles, their bonuses, all that stuff, they're just pushing a little lump of camel dung down the hall. Isn't that like absurd? But that's really the correct perspective on things. And if you think that stuff is valuable and you hold on to it, when Christ comes back, do you know what you're going to have? A lump of camel dung. That's it. Hey, well done, good and able servant. Keep the dung, right? Sure, you earned it. But that's what people give their lives for. Compared to following Christ, everything else here is a lump of dung. But we get deceived and don't realize that truth. We think it's something. And we sacrifice all kinds of things for it, which is not very bright. Okay, enough about winning. Let's talk about without a word. Um, actually, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, some people have been to a seminar by a guy called Bill Gothard that talks about making an appeal, and I think that's a really good. But whenever I understand or think about authority and how it works, I think about something I have a little experience, and it's called parenting. And what if you tell a kid to do something, he says, well, I want to make an appeal. Kid's not submitting, right? What if you tell the kid, I don't want to hear it? Oh, but let me make my appeal. I don't want to hear it. But, 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 they're not submitting. If they have to say what they want to say, they're not submitting. You can invite them at times to hear, but if you say, I don't want to hear anymore, if they're submitting, they don't say anything more. It works the same way. Paul, Peter says, you win those who are disobedient to the word without a word. There's a little bit of literary parallel, parallelism there for emphasis. And that means no appeal. There are times to talk, there are times to say, can we talk? Definitely times to do that. There's also times to not do it. And for those of you who are sometimes compelled to talk, I think you can be more Christ-like in those situations by paying attention to Acts 8.32. This is actually the context of the Ethiopian eunuch, I'm quoting Psalm four, uh, Isaiah 43. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb before his shears, he was silent, so he opened not his mouth. <laughs> Nothing. Right? That's, that's it. And if something in you says, but, 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 you, don't, you haven't got it yet. Right? Without a word. That's what the text says. That was Jesus. There are times he spoke, there are times he didn't. And if you know the context of Isaiah 43, it was the basis of him getting all kinds of great reward. It was God's will for him to be, it was actually please God to bruise him, to crush him, to cause all kinds of difficulty in Christ's life. And then, as a result of that, Christ through his suffering gained a whole lot more. Okay, so there are times to keep your mouth shut. And then Proverbs has lots of good admonitions in those mind, those words. And I think it was Mark Twain said it's better um, to be, to keep silent and be thought of as a fool than open your mouth to confirm it. Remove all that. Remove all that out. Remove all that. Thank you. Okay, blameless behavior. Um, this one is the word that frequently gets translated um, holy up above. Oh, you're pure, sacred, chaste. Yeah. Um, from what I gather from most husbands, they'd rather not have their uh, wives be chaste uh, in the modest sense, but that's another story uh, for a different audience. But this, the basic root of this is blameless. And they have a behavior that you can't find fault with. They do all that they're supposed to do. And it's blameless behavior done in the service of God. Peter put a lot of emphasis on people's behavior, what they actually did. So I just went through and pulled out the verses for it for you uh, in First Peter. A lot of them came out of the NIV. Uh, our Father's Holy First... Uh, Peter 1.15, be holy in all you do. That's, that's still a command directed towards New Testament believers. You do all in a holy manner. We are actually redeemed from the empty, aimless, futile way of life that was handed down to us. We, you know, basically, God bought us back out of that so we wouldn't continue to do it, but a lot of us go back and play in the dung heap. 
2.12, live, that's our word for conduct, conduct yourselves, such good lives among the bad guys, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of uh, he visits us. So even though you have this pointy haired person saying all kinds of evil things against you, live a good life. 316, keep a clear conscience that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ might be ashamed. People are doing what's good. They're speaking maliciously and slandering the people. Yep. <clears throat> 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3.11, since all these things, the whole earth is going to poop, go beyond, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy living, holy conduct, and godliness? You kind of get the idea that you're supposed to have good conduct regardless of what happens in everything you do, regardless of the effect it has on the other person, because God requires it of you. It's pretty simple in all you do. Um, James 3.17 is a, a place where this word is used. Wisdom from above is first pure, peaceful, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Um, this pure word is the one that's the correct, uh, the one that's in there. We're supposed to have that. I think that was the right one. One of my favorite Greek uh, playwrights, a guy called Euripides, kind of understood that reason was a feeble wall against the furies of passion that rage within our souls. And he has one of his characters say this really insightful line. It would have been interesting to see how Euripides would have handled the scriptures. But he has the character say, my hands are pure, but my heart isn't. And I thought, how apt is that a description of most Christians? Outwardly, their hands are pure, but inwardly, their heart is just as corrupt, dung heap building as any other worldling. Because I haven't gone through that transformation process. So, all believers are supposed to be blameless. All believers are supposed to live good lives before others. And some people don't. It's, and they lose as a result. Just have respect and deference for the other person, uh, for the position. Um, why Paul practiced what he preached. In Acts 23.5, the high priest orders Paul to be slot. Whack that guy in the side of the face. And uh, Paul basically says, may God judge you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they said, don't you know that's the high priest? Now, if I were there, I probably would have said, well, he shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why never made me an apostle. <laughs> and he said, oops, I didn't know he was the high priest. Because the word says, don't speak evil. Folks like that. Of the authorities that God has put in your life. So, here, this authority was corrupt. Did what was totally wrong. Unjustified. Mean. And it hurt. And Paul says, shouldn't speak evil of these people. That shows that Paul was submitted to God and the authorities that God had in line. Okay, now we get the thing with the most ink, meek. It's a word that um, is so misunderstood. Um, someone once described Christianity as uh, a mild-mannered guy exhorting mild-mannered people to be more mild-mannered. <laughs> and the, there's a cartoon character, a guy called Casper Milktoast, who is just, uh, he's before most of our times, <laughs> see a few nods. But it's just like spineless, just, you know, mousious. That's not what it means at all. So it's only used about five or six times in the New Testament. And uh, it's used of Jesus, meek and mild Jesus, who uh, also managed to, uh, he's just, you know, meek and lowly of heart, take my yoke upon me in Matthew 1135. About 10 chapters later, in 2112, he basically takes a group uh, of cords, whips them together into a scourge, and he goes through and clears the temple. Wasn't it very meek and mild there when he's kicking over the tables and you know, whipping people left, right, and sideways. Uh, Moses, another guy who was called the most meek man on the earth at the time, 
Yet uh, he managed to do things with a leader group of wayward people. So what is this meek characteristic that is supposed to be demonstrated? So uh, I gave you the word for it in the original Greek, it's pros. There we go. It solves everything, doesn't it? P-R-A-U-S, right? That's what we're supposed to be. Guys and gals, you're supposed to be pros. And proud of it. <laughs> All right, so what's pros? Well, we go back to my friend Aristotle, who was fond of describing words by the, what he called the golden mean. <coughs> When he wanted to figure out what characteristic a virtuous person should demonstrate, he defined the virtues as the midpoint between two extremes. And this word for prous is the midpoint between showing too much anger and showing no anger. And most people's view of the Christian life is you never get angry. Well, then you don't you wouldn't be prous because a person who never gets angry is not prous. Prous is kind of in the middle. It's a person who shows appropriate anger. Moses shows anger appropriately, the nation of Israel. Um, Jesus shows anger appropriately, um, not just with the money changers. This other great verse where he looks at the hardness of heart of the Pharisees who are rejecting him. He looks at him in anger. So we're supposed to have this thing that's midway in between. And an image that also Aristotle speaks of is a wild horse that had been tamed for domestic uses. They had power, they had might, but it was under control. And there are more usages outside the New Testament where it talks about tamed strength under control. It's not controlled by emotions, passions, or circumstances. What controls your anger? For the most part, it's circumstances. That you perceive a certain way, that well up with you an emotion, and you're like that cartoon character that gets redder and redder and redder, and then all of a sudden the steam comes out the ears. Yeah, we're, we're kind of, we don't have prowess when we have that. We're not meek. So it's strength under control. Um, Titus 3, 2 mentions it when he says we're supposed to speak evil of no man, to not be drawler, brawlers, fighters, uh, to be just, equitable, showing all meekness to all men. Happens to be a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Now, obviously, fruits don't happen automatically, because a lot of people are lacking love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, humility. I think it's a gentleness word is here is prowess and self-control. Um, we are actually told to chase after it, which means the fruit of the Spirit is something you also develop. First uh, Timothy 6.11 says, Flee all of youthful lust stuff and follow, chase after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, long-suffering, and meekness. Don't leave home without it. Get it. It's one of those things you're supposed to get, just like <coughs> hope and love. It's frequently enjoined as a thing that believers are supposed to have in their references, relations with each other. Be completely humble. That's meek. And gentle. Patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to give unity the spirit and the bond of peace. Ephesians 4.2 says, Colossians 3.12, you, chosen people, really special folks, holy, set apart, dearly beloved, get dressed. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, prowess, gentleness, patience, long suffering. I'm supposed to put these things on. I guess somewhere early in my Christian life, I must have seen this definition because uh, it is one of the things I would um, think is really great. Online Bible has it under uh, Thayer's lexicon. I'm not sure if it came from there or not. They didn't cite the source. But it says, that disposition of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good and therefore without disputing or resisting. <clears throat> but God, I need this. But God, I need this. But God, give me this. But God, give me this. Well, you don't have props. You don't, you don't have meekness. You accept God's dealings as good. Blessed be the Lord who has given me this affliction, this pointy-haired person, this difficulty. It's good. It comes from the hand of a good God. And therefore, I'm not going to fuss about it. Uh, Ronica Rogers in the Linguistic Key uh, has a number of spots where their um, compilers define this word. He said, in the Old Testament, the meek are those 
wholly, completely relying on God rather than their own strength to defend themselves against injustice. Right? Whenever I see this, I think of David being chased by the idiot Saul, who's trying to kill him, who has the opportunity to kill him. David's been anointed king. He's in a cave. Saul comes in, and David is so close he can actually tear some of his garment off, and he doesn't take things into his own hands. He said, God will put me in the position when I'm supposed to be there. And he waits patiently with joy while experiencing all kinds of grief from um, Saul. Holy relying on God rather than on strength to defend themselves against justice. Thus, meekness towards evil people means knowing God is permitting the injuries they inflict. And that he is using them to purify his special people. And that he will deliver his special people in his time. Prates, which is the uh, noun form, denotes the humble and gentle attitude which expresses itself in a patient submissiveness to offense, free from malice and the desire for revenge. So many times, they get me, I'll get them. It's the law of the jungle. Yeah, but we're not in the jungle. No, concrete jungle, but not near the Christ pasture. It's controlled strength, the ability to bear reproaches and slights without bitterness or resentment. That's something we should all aspire to. The, uh, that's the meek. The next one is what's normally translated quiet, and it's a poor translation. There are a couple spots where it could possibly be rendered silence. It's really tranquil. We're all enjoined earlier in Peter to lead tranquil lives. You're supposed to do your work with tranquility. That means you don't do it with silence. <laughs> it means you don't get agitated over things not going your way because the Good Shepherd is right with you. If, if you have wandered away from the Good Shepherd, duh, you're going to have to do it on your own because the Shepherd's not there. But if you have an awareness that the Shepherd is there, you can be tranquil, peaceable, quiet. The li word literally could be translated steadfast because it literally means keep your seat. <laughs> you think of someone jumping up, wait, wait, that's not right. Keep your shirt on, keep your seat, sit down, breathe deeply, God's in control. Um, it's having composure without turmoil. Uh, it's well ordered and undisturbed despite um, external circumstances and exhibits a peaceful attitude. Yeah, you can see that that would probably be a thing that a husband would um, respond positively towards. Tranquility, peacefulness. It's definitely not silence, because silence is like, you know, do your work with silence. So, you got that file? Mm. <laughs> so, what do you think about this one? Mm. <laughs> yeah, it obviously, it doesn't fit that context. But it, it's with a quietness and peacefulness, because you know God's in control. Uh, this word doesn't show up too many times in the New Testament, but a spot in the Old Testament where it shows up in the Septuagint translation is Psalm 131.2. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother is my soul within me. Notice that who is doing the quieting there? The person. It's like a baby that has nursed and is just really happy except for the, waiting for the burp. And it's just, okay, that's it. Okay, before they get fed is, <laughs> I need food. They're going to starve me here. And then after they've eaten, they're satisfied. That's the characteristic that needs to be cultivated. But you can only cultivate that with the trust that God knows what's best, when it's best, will provide what's best because I'm rightly related to him. So, that finishes up the whole rest of them. Seven is a quiet, obedient trust and hope in God. Um, the word for obedient there is to listen under. Just line up under and listen under. Like, I'm really listening for what has to be said. There's a confidence that God will make things right, just like Sarah had. And it's a hope in God. Uh, I don't know how many, it's been a long time since I looked at um, Pilgrim's Progress, which was written, by the way, while John Bunyan was unjustly thrown into prison. And he was writing about, about the Christian life, and it's a path, you're going to a celestial city. And at one point, the people kind of divert off the path into this nice meadow, which turns out to be owned by the 
giant of despair or something like that. And he throws them in their dungeon and he beats them up every day and he tries to get them to kill themselves. And the two of them, Pilgrim and whatever, is, are, is in the, uh, are in the dungeon. And they realize after a couple of these beatings and a couple of days goes by, go by that they have the key to get out of the dungeon of despair. By their own stupidity, they left the path, they got into the wrong thing, they're holding on because God said, don't kill yourself. And they realize that deep within their breasts, they hold the key, and that key is hope. And hope and trust in God's promises is what got them, gets them out of the dungeon of despair. And I think the thing that enables a person to obey in the midst of bad circumstances, obey all the way, right away, all the way with a happy spirit, most of you know that, is the expectation that God will eventually change the circumstances. And if decades and decades and decades go by, he will eventually reward you far, far better than you could have been rewarded here on earth. So the situation goes on. It goes on forever until Christ comes back. So this confident obedience. Uh, I love this passage from Habakkuk. He says, there's no blossom, there's no fruit, there's no oil, there's no flock, there's no birds, there's nothing. Yet, I will rejoice in nothing. No, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy, glory in the God of my salvation. He sees nothing. You know, there's not a block, before you get fruit, you have to have a blossom. And there's not even a blossom. There's like hopeless, hopeless, hopeless situation. And one of the truths of Christianity is when you got nothing, you got God. And that's the thing he rejoices in. But we are so fixed on, I want to get my pile of camel dung bigger, <laughs> that we miss all the joy that God has in store for us. It's incredible. Um, we watched a movie. I can't remember the fortress. What's the name of the movie? I left the middle. Hidden I Fortress. Play. What? Hidden Fortress. Hidden Fortress. It's by the same guy who did The Seven Samurai. I picked it up because I saw that this was one that uh, most influenced George Lucas when he did the uh, Star Wars series. And it's actually pretty decent. But one of the things that happens in this is this Shogun Lord um, sacrifices his sister to save the princess. And the princess, who's a 16-year-old girl, is really ticked off that you had this happen. And then the old mother says, you are diminishing her sacrifice. That was her highest good, to sacrifice herself for you, for her lord, her you know, master. And that should be our attitude, that our highest, highest good is to sacrifice herself for God. A lot of us, our highest good is we'll sacrifice ourselves for our best interest. <laughs> but what about, where does God come into the picture? So this idea of saying, yes, my lord. You always have that in the old movies. Um, something we don't seem to say. Yeah, boss. It's probably your modern equivalent of it. You acknowledge that they're the master. <clears throat> Number nine, do good, fulfilling your responsibilities, doing what's in the other person's best interest, even if they do not respond independently of what the other person does. George Mueller tells a story of a rich German merchant who would spend all his nights at the pub getting plastered. And, you know, he would roll home way after closing. And his wife would have sent the servants to bed, and she would wait up for the husband. And she would greet him, see if he needed anything, help him get to bed. Sometimes he would just pass out, and you know, she'd drag him to bed and get him undressed. And he's there one night boasting to his friends about, you know, how his wife will, you know, do all this stuff for him. And they said, oh, yeah, sure. He said, come and see. So, you know, two or three in the morning, he drags his cronies back. He says, you'll even make a meal for us. So she greets him, welcomes them in. She makes a meal for him. And this has been going on for you know, who knows how long. And uh, she makes a meal for him. We like anything to eat? Sure. You know, so they, they sets the table, makes the meal, and then kind of retires. And as they're about to start, one of his friends says, how can you treat such a woman so poorly? And he gets up and walks out. And one by one, all the guys, not even touching the stuff, basically call the guy an idiot and walk out. The Spirit of God used those other pagan unbelievers to convict the guy of his sin. He goes, seeks his wife's forgiveness, and becomes a Christian. Sometimes it works. But if it doesn't, it's still the right thing to do. 
fulfilling your responsibilities independent of what the other person does, and without alarm, without anxious concern for the consequences. How, how do you not have anxiety? Well, because you're prayerful. Philippians 4, you know God's in control, Romans 8, 28, and you can trust him. You know he's in control. Okay, so those are winning ways. It requires confidence and trust in God to do what God said. And you do what you, you're supposed to, he'll do what he's supposed to, and we all live happily ever after. Okay, questions. And some of the ones below are, are really worth addressing. Yeah, okay, now. You mentioned that if you didn't have joy while submitting, then you're not really submitting. And that's what, that's was, what the guy said. Why could, why could you not well, be submitting if, and doing exactly the same You're doing the thing. Your hands are clean, but the heart's dirty. It's like the joy comes from knowing that you are choosing what's best. If you are submitting and you're not joyful, you're resentful, you're bitter, you're looking for a desire for revenge, yeah, so there's no joy. You're, you're grumbling and complaining that you have to do this. So it's not submission. There's no joy. It's not biblical submission. It's outward conformity. You are basically complying, not lining up under, because submission means you embrace their agenda, because you recognize it is what's best. You can force a slave to comply. But it's really not biblical submission, so there's no joy. Well, then what, then, then what about you know things being difficult in general? I mean, we definitely talk about that often. That even and though you know we're going into a habit or things that are difficult and right, you're you doing do them it, because you, you know the there's right a thing. higher good down the road. Joy comes from choosing what's best. No joy, you haven't chosen what's best. It's not easy. Uh, James says, "Have joy in every trial." Yeah, trial, the joy in trials, exactly. Difficulty and, and and Peter, he's all about the fact that you're rejoicing in the midst of tough circumstances. James was that way too. So then would it be better to not submit since it would be fake or false anyway, no. and go along, or would you still be, do what you're supposed to do and submit and, and do what you're supposed to do? Because obviously that's complete disobedience, and realize that you need to ask God for help and change the way you're thinking about it. If you can't do it with joy, you're not doing it biblically. Is yeah. right to say that joy, well, joy is not a feeling. So you can be in the midst of a situation saying, I know that this is the best choice, and I know that at the end of this, I'm going to be so glad having done it. Right now, my emotions aren't totally lining up with that. Like, it's hard. I, 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 I agree, but I'm also saying that that's wrong. Okay. Because you think of Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. They were just beaten. What are they doing? Singing. They're singing songs of joy. The, one of the reasons Christianity spread so fast is because the martyrs died so well. So if you are there being the martyr, in the bad sense, suffering, oh, woe is me, so hard, following Jesus, carrying my cross. It's like, that's not going to win anybody. And that's because you are not doing that with biblical strength doing it biblically, and you're not going to get a biblical result as a result. So when, uh, when Peter and Paul uh, appeared before the high priest, oh, yes. um, and then they were beaten and they were sent uh, away, they went away rejoicing that they were counted worthy of so right. yeah. And don't you remember Jesus' sermon on the mount? You know, blessed are you, men men revile you and persecute you and say all men are evil. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, because that's how they treated the prophets. So if you don't have the joy, you don't have the biblical perspective. I think if, if you don't have the external perspective about it, then it's very hard to have the joy. Right. If you think about just the temporal element of it, yes, then it's very hard to have the joy. Totally. Yeah, Fiona. Can you go to number two? Question number two. Um, in what way does internal meekness, strength, and tranquility differ from outward spinelessness and silence? Frequently, the coward's way out is to say nothing. The meek way out is to say something. So when you see injustice, you know, one of the things that God gets on the case of Israel for in Isaiah chapter 1 is they're not executing justice. They're just like, they're seeing wrong stuff be done, and they are not withstanding it. So there's a lot of people who think, oh, I'll just you know, keep my nose to the grindstone and not say anything, not do anything. Well, that's not biblical meekness. That's cowardice. That's not being... You know, people who know God will stand strong and do val 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 valiantly. That, that's spinelessness. That's just, that's, you know, worldly. 
Now that just completely confused me because I was trying to buy into this submit quiet, tranquil joy. Because you know that. Yeah. And now, though, if I feel it's an injustice, it's okay to say something. No, not be, if you feel it's an injustice, and uh, I take exception on both those things. Well, Feeling it's an injustice does not make it injustice, and okay to say something just because it's justice, it's not always God's will for you to say something. So it all depends upon <laughs> dependence upon God. It's like, what does God want me to feel in this situation? What does God want me to do in this situation? It's the cultivating the daily dependence of people being filled and controlled by the Spirit. Yes, Steve. So in the job realm, right? So I've heard you say, um, you know, you're actually working for the company, not the immediate boss. Right. And if your boss is a pointy haired boss and is asking you to do all sorts of wacky things that you think you're you think are wrong and not in the best interest of your company, do you, what do you do? What's submission look like? Okay, I think we covered that a little bit in the Sermon on Work, but if your job description, you're being hired basically, particularly someone in your exact position, to bring up those things. That, that's your job. And even if they don't want to hear it, you are telling them this is what the legal way is. Marriage and work are two different spheres in terms of submission. So you have a responsibility. It's like the military guy. If he's being asked to commit an illegal, or follow an illegal order, He's not allowed to follow that. So if in the work realm you're being asked to do that stuff, you might want to consider, well, what's the worst that could happen if I actually do this? You know, is it, is it illegal, immoral, will it bring down the company? Um, do I have a responsibility to say something? And if it, you do have a responsibility, say something and then do what you're supposed to do. That's simple. But if you are in a marriage situation asked to do that stuff, you might want to consider, well, this just could be God's way of testing and purifying. Uh, number four, it says, how should you respond if stupid Saul or Balaam's ass tells you to do something ridiculous? <laughs> um, this is not a good way to address a husband, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> Saul basically was telling Dave all kinds of wrong stuff. But, so, yeah, there's, David still respected the position. He just didn't do, well, yeah, the stuff. Come out here so I can kill you. Um, I think I'll pass. Balaam's ass is interesting because in this... Uh, the donkey is talking to him, and God can communicate to us even through a jackass. <laughs> Put that one in there deliberately. You get the idea? The person doesn't have to know everything. They can be just a stupid idiot, but God could still be communicating. So if you have a pointy-haired boss who's a stupid idiot, or even a pointy-haired co-worker, you know, like one of the people out of Dilbert, um, you might want to stop and think before you respond, what's, what's God saying through this? And when we get to submitting to one another, it's, you know, I'll expand on this a little more. But if you're, if you're being asked to do something on the job that clearly goes against your terms of employment and the law, then you obviously have to suffer doing it's right. Okay. Um, well, this kind of fits along with the same question. Um, Abigail, who was married to Nathan, um, Abel the Fool. Yeah, he, he commanded her to do something and she didn't. But she ends up being praised for it. So I'm just wondering how that, how to reconcile right. her example and. Yeah. Well, she's responding to the, the, the godly king. She had other responsibilities, and the, you know, the fool, in one sense, might have been asking her to do things that were not in accord with the law of the land and other stuff. So, um, when you're married to a fool, yeah, yeah, it's a little more difficult. Barbara, um, I may not be remembering all the details, but did he? Uh, instruct her to do something, or did she take the initiative to warn David and his men that her husband had made a decision to destroy them, to attack them? Yeah, I think it's some of those things. Did she? Did he what? actually instruct her to do something? I mean, it's possible. He told her to do something that would insult the king. I think it was like for, <coughs> like not to allow David there, really? and she ends up going out and taking supplies and meeting David. Well, she didn't, right, in that case, if, that, if that's exactly what it said, she didn't she, she fulfill the letter of his law. She, right. she took the supplies. Yeah, but that's a, yeah, Garrett. Um, I'll come back to the uh, confusion uh, that, that Danelle might have that about the getting anger for injustice. I mean, you think about the examples that Jesus got angry, it was never about injustice against him as a person. Mm -hmm. It was always against injustice against God. 
or injustice against other people when he wanted to heal somebody on the subway and they were angry about it. That's, that's what made him angry because it was injustice against the other person. So I guess to be on the safe side, don't, don't get angry for injustice against yourself. Accept that that is God's will and, and, and try to learn from it and enjoy it. But if you get angry, at least get angry when it's injustice against somebody else or, or really against God. Yeah, I think it's coming up. Like when he was threatened, he didn't respond with threats, but he entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. If you are entrusting yourself to him who judges righteously and you are in an this situation, you will not do anything because God's making it clear that you should entrust yourself to him. Yeah, see. So um, this thing about denying yourself is probably pretty important. Um, but then God made me, right? His image, uh, he knows, you know, knew me for it, all that. What does that look like? I mean, so if I deny myself, am I might just a kind of shell and then and God fills me or what? The things that I usually put when I re make reference to deny yourself is your ambitions, your goals, the stuff that's going to give you value, worth, and significance. That's the stuff. A lot of people say, yeah, deny yourself food. And there are people who yeah, just eat beans for all their life. <laughs> you know, and they think, oh, I'm doing what God wants. No, no. It's like, the thing is, are you going to go for your glory or God's glory? And the vast, vast, vast majority of Christian humanity lives for their own glory. They're clueless about God's glory, and they do not live for it. And it's tragic. Because Satan feel, is one. How should we feel when we've kind of emptied ourselves of those things? Because those were, you know, that was my aspiration to be. Well, it's like Esther in one sense. You know, she's queen, but for the good of others. It's not for her own throne. Uh, Jesus, Philippians 2, a great example of this one. Emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and served. So if you're serving others for their eternal destiny and God's glory, yeah, that's what it's all about. You know, you can be the CEO of a company, but, you know, your worth and value comes from the fact that you're doing what is pleasing to God. Because being a CEO of a company is really just another dunk ball in the heap. It's just another, you know, one of those things that's not going to last. Is there food here? No. Okay. <laughs> um, other questions? Yeah. Laura. Um, what if our, an authority figure Calls us to pursue dumb. Like, go what get a promotion. <laughs> okay. okay, if it's an authority figure that's a legitimate authority figure, then do what the authority figure says. Um, you might want to also figure out is it you know, a Christian authority that's, is this tied in, how is this tied in with God's glory? So, uh, that's what we're supposed to be living for. Kind of looks pretty straightforward. Yeah, Gary. You mentioned the uh, the importance of uh, not my will but your will be done. Um, when you really think about it, everything that we have, our talents, our family, our circumstances, country with time which we were born, our intelligence, our health, and our will, everything is given to us, and we don't have much control over it except our will. That's the only thing that we can really give, kind of. To God, or really give it for ourselves. I would subscribe to that. It's kind of the key of it. I totally agree. The will is key. That's the thing we have the most control over. And we are a result of the choices our will has made. I, I wanted to mention, I forgot to do this. I was talking with Misan uh, the other night at the Elders thing. And uh, she mentioned this book by uh, Elizabeth Elliot called Be Still My Soul. And I haven't read it, but it had things that Mason said had a lot of these principles about the ability to trust God in the midst of what looked like scary circumstances. Um, it's, it's good, so you might want to talk to her about that one later. Hey, yeah, Corey. I just wondered this for years. I feel like I looked this up, own and husband is not the same word. word. So I, knowing each word is important to count, why does the author feel it necessary to reiterate whose husband you're supposed to be speaking to? He does it twice in here. Is it yeah. Like Why does he say your own husband? He does it twice. So it's not just a general communal, you know, submit to all men. It's, you know, submit to your own husband. You know, just so you're not sure about which husband that is, it's the one that... <laughs> <laughs> the, the one that you own. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it, it, I'm sure that the Spirit of God knew this could have been misapplied. 
And I'm sure there are people where they've done it, but that's uh, not the way it's supposed to be. Um, how does submission or question number one work in different cultural settings? Same way, it's not a cultural thing, it's a universal thing, and I've done other stuff on that. Um, if we're supposed to submit to each other, why are women singled out? Any thoughts on that one? Your commands were believed we're supposed to submit to each other, so why? I don't think that's an accurate question if you read the rest of the Bible. focus here on women, but they also ask men uh, to love their wives and respect them and take care of them. And they have things that they're supposed to do and they're supposed to submit to each other. So I think that question is a misleading question. Okay, other thoughts? The thing that was given during the fall. Yeah. What, what? The curse uh, that was given during the fall. That's about yeah. Women wanting to be, ma be, ma be the master. That this might be a particularly hard thing. Right. Submitting to each other is a universal thing for believers, but then there are also hierarchical relationships that continue to exist within the um, body of Christ. Husbands are never, never told to submit to their wives. <laughs> they have responsibilities towards them, it's their functionality things, there's a hierarchical structure ultimately designed for people's benefit. Um, let's see, do values determine our submission? You do what you value. That simple. You have their own values. You got to change them. How does that self relate to submission? If you don't die yourself, you won't be able to submit. Okay. What if it hurts? That's the idea. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between nagging and bringing something up? Um, it all depends on the context. Yes. <laughs> depends on how you do it. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not saying I'm a good married. I'm going to talk about guys next time. And I'll address more the exceptions. But right now, it's kind of good to have people live with, maybe I just shouldn't do this. And let's just see if you can do it for a couple weeks. I'm going to address the next time. It's not only how, I think it's also the motivation, really the motivation. How often? Yeah. <laughs> That's an indication of the motivation. <laughs> <laughs> Women nag husbands for the same reason they nag their kids. Issues of security and significance. Not because of the people's best interest, usually. Okay, food's here, time to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who is trustworthy. You are all wise. You always know what's best when it's best. We can trust you every single day. Give us the mindset of the Lord Jesus, who can say, not my will, but your will be done. May that permeate all of our lives and relationships. The glory of the Lord Jesus and the benefit of others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.